everybody can take their seats. We've got Peter Bissell from Bissell Brothers coming up here. Um, a few weeks after I asked Peter of Portland, Maine's Bissell Brothers to speak here, he emailed me and wanted to know why I wanted him here. And I, you see, I wanted him here because he's going to give you some unconventional advice, advice that I don't think that you hear at these type of conferences. See, Peter takes many of his cues from entrepreneurs, ex executives, and authors who are from outside the industry. I know, original thinking, that can be dangerous, but that's why we're here. So when Peter appeared on the Brewbound podcast earlier this year, I, I left that conversation feeling energized. And, and I think that's because a lot of what's happening at Bissell is working. And Peter co-founded that brewery with his brother Noah in December 2013. Over the last six years, Bissell Brothers has quickly become one of the it brewers in Portland, Maine. Well, in all of New England, I should say. So it's a must stop for any craft beer lover. I know I make, ev I make the journey every time I go up there. So in that time, in that six years that Bissell Brothers has been around, they've grown to 10,000 barrels and 30 employees. Whether or not Peter's learning from the beer industry, he's learning a lot, and he's here to share some of that experience with you. So I'll shut up and get him up here. Peter, welcome to the stage. Hi. This is a first for me, the Tony Robbins energy. Uh, I'm liking it, actually. Uh, and I didn't prepare, oh, there I am. I didn't prepare a slideshow, uh, and when the conference started yesterday, I was like, oh, uh, it's, it's kind of silly. I, I've personally created probably like 90% of anything visual that has to do with Bissell Brothers. Couldn't find the time to make a slideshow, uh, so sorry about that, but uh, my goal is, as Justin said, is to deliver some value. Um, take it for what you will. Uh, let's get into it. Also, uh, <laughs> um, so I flew from a snowstorm in Maine on Tuesday. It took a long time to get here. And I got to tell you, I <laughs> this is probably like my seventh time in this part of the world. And it <laughs> yesterday was the first time I've ever seen a cloud here. <laughs> I was like, I feel a little cheated. I came for some, uh, some, some sun. I came from snow. But uh, it looks like today's a little bit better. So happy to be here. Um, so for a little context, uh, uh, as Justin sort of alluded to, Bissell Brothers is about to turn six in a few days. And uh, the reason, I think, really why I was selected is uh, um, I'm guessing that a lot of you aren't familiar with Bissell Brothers. You know, we're about as far apart in the country as you can possibly be and still be in the same country. So um, we, as it shook out, ended up, we didn't know it at the time, but we were probably one of, I would say, 10 breweries in the Northeast that ended up sort of developing what would become known as New England IPA. Uh, we don't call it that now, and we, uh, we didn't know it at the time, but that's kind of how it shook out. So after we started, uh, we uh, uh, were dealing with things. Uh, it's still a very strong on-premise business model. Again, that sort of developed in real time. That wasn't necessarily the idea going into it, but that's what it became. Uh, we were dealing with long lines, things like that, when we were like four people in a room. So uh, it's, it's been a fun six years. Uh, we've grown. Uh, the brewery has moved. We actually started in what is now sort of a famous building called Industrial Way in Portland on the outskirts of town. Most people know it as the brewery building across the street from Allagash. Uh, Allagash was a huge help to us in our early days. Uh, we since moved closer to town, bigger facility, and opened a second uh, facility in our hometown of Milo. Um, Milo is about 2,000 people in north central Maine, one of the poorest areas in the, in the country, and we, we fully sent it with a, with a new brewery with a cool ship, uh, focusing on wood fermentation, uh, a lot of fooders, a lot of oak barrels, uh, and uh, that's kind of where we are today. Two facilities still primarily distributed in Maine, uh, but branching out into new markets. So uh, that's a little bit of uh, the background on why I'm, I, I'm here. Uh, and what I wanted to do with this talk today was really distill down uh, things that I found to be timeless and uh, that uh, 
I didn't want to get into the trap of talking to you guys about things that we found success doing because there's, I mean, there's what, like 7,000 breweries in the country. Each one of them has such a different set of circumstances and a different level of measuring success. Uh, but we, we tend to homogenize things, I feel like, all right, this is what you do and it should work for everyone. Like even just being here and uh, getting out and about to some breweries yesterday afternoon, like it's just a different world. So uh, what I've distilled down is things that I've found to be timeless and that can really apply to any company in any situation. So uh, the first concept is leadership from the front. Uh, I have observed that the actual skills required to open a business remain separate in many regards to those required to lead a business day in, day out. Leadership by example from the front in taking ownership of all outcomes of a business's performance is an essential part of a cohesive, unified group mentality and clear business direction. Uh, so background on that. We, uh, my brother's six years younger than me. He, he makes all our beer recipes. He's led production, you know, but when we opened, you know, he was... 23, 22, uh, you know, so we, we were very green and we had so much to learn. Uh, it wasn't like we're going to be the, the, the boss, you know, we were the bosses, but we, we were, it was a very stressful time because we had this vision that we wanted to see through uh, of, of giving these, the, the people in our market something they had never seen before. We saw this hole in the industry so clearly and it was like, it was like, man, like we, we need to get to here, but we have the learning curve is very steep. You know, I remember the first day that we began working with the brewing equipment. It was incredibly intimidating. You know, we had not worked at some other brewery. This was all brand new to us. So, we had a there was this amount that there was this um, sort of frantic energy building up because we had this laundry list of things that we felt incredibly um, um, not up to par with, you know, is, uh, uh, so that forces learning and that forces, uh, but at the same time, you know, we began to, to, to bring uh, employees on, you know, like many startups, it was just friends that we pulled in, you know, there was no real formal hiring process and thankfully, almost all of those people are still with us today, which we'll get to more about um, cultivating a staff, uh, or a good staff here in a little bit, but um, uh, so, we also had to learn how to manage people, which is a whole different skill set than learning how to make New England IPA. <laughs> um, so, what that developed into, and what it, it carries on to this day, you know, Noah and I are very active parts of the business, and this, this really, uh, if, you, if you look at other examples throughout history, uh, and, and, and if you get close to other companies and see it, there's no other way because what happens now, because Bissell Brothers has experienced some relative success uh, in our market, and the potential is there to then begin leading from the back. And what leading from the back is, is not owning critical decisions, you know, trying to put it on someone else. So, all right, I'm the owner, you figure this out. If it goes bad, you're in big trouble. If it goes well, I'm going to take the credit because I'm the owner. Um, you see it in other companies. I've, I've seen it in very successful breweries, uh, and it's, it's toxic. Uh, it it, it, it um, creates fear in the staff, and uh, what you really want to do, what, this, again, this is, take this as you will. This has worked for us, though, but you know, Noah is not directing people. He's developing things and processes and beers with our staff. He's leading from the front. He's still the most knowledgeable person by far. We've got some really talented, really experienced brewers on our staff now. They still look to him. And I run the business. I do most of our branding and design. Um, I'm beginning to segue out of that now and, uh, and focus more on um, uh, new markets and kind of figuring out a, a plan. We've never had like a five-year plan or anything like that. Um, but we're on the floor working and own, most importantly, we're owning the, the critical decisions. Noah and I still make 100% of them uh, because it's, it's on us. If it fails, really, it's, it's, it's on us. And I, I realized this a few years ago when, uh, um, again, we'll, we'll talk a little bit more about staff in, in, a, in a minute here, but, um, you know, we had a couple people that, didn't work out. Uh, I think three people to date have left. One of them moved out this way. Uh, that was a positive life change. He didn't want to leave Bissell, but his fiance got a job out here that she had to take, so he's out here now. I actually saw him last night. The other two people weren't good fits, and the, 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 I, I saw what I'm talking about played out in those moments. I was mad, you know, I, I wanted to be mad at them because it's like, just, just do 
the job how I want you to do it. Uh, they left on their own accord. Uh, there was no firing. But afterwards, I realized we had no one to blame but ourselves. If Noah and I hired them incorrectly, which we did, it was kind of like on a whim. Hey, this guy would work out. He'd help out kind of nebulously with, with office stuff. Come on in, you know? We look back, and him and I, uh, my brother and I talked, and we're like, man, this is entirely all f- our fault. After they left, you know, thankfully they sensed that they weren't a good fit, and they, they left, and so we, that led to this very rigorous sort of hiring practice um, because it's, it's on us, you know. There was no one else to point the finger to, and uh, we really try to, um, let's see, where am I at here? Uh, we, we, we talk about th- that, that when this one employee in particular left, that was kind of a turning point for Noah and I. We're like, Man, like, we've been doing this from the beginning, you know, owning things. We, we maybe got a little cocky, thought, hey, you know, like, we've had some success. This is someone else's fault. It's an incredibly easy trap to get into when you're in a position of leadership or it doesn't require you, that you be an owner, but I'm guessing most people in this room have some type of sway over their, their companies. And... Uh, it's, it's a very easy trap to get into, so you want to resist that at all. Like, if you're the leader, whether that be manager or owner, make the critical, tough choices yourself. The staff, by design, will fall in line and, and look to you. Uh, yeah, it, leadership from the front, I can't stress it enough. Uh, it's difficult. There are times now where I'm like, man, I've been doing this five, six years. Like, can someone else take care of this? You know, I'm getting blown up right now with a couple crises back at, at Bissell Brothers because, and I feel like this happens every time I leave, and it's not, uh, they, they look to you. And, but they're, they're, I don't really know what I'm saying at this point, so I'm going to move on. But uh, um, do not, uh, it's very easy to get into the habit of, leading from behind and trying to, to pin the tough choices on someone else that you can either take the credit for if it works out or punish and blame if it goes wrong. It's don't, don't do it. A <laughs> um, couple analogies I had written down to sort of seal that up. Uh, any staff member of mine should feel like if the business were a ship in times of trouble, just as a maritime captain would, ensure the crew's safety to the best of my ability and go down with that ship if I must. That is extreme ownership. That produces confident, loyal staff. That produces respect from peers. Extreme, complete ownership of the company's fate. You can spot leaders leading from the back by their penchant for complaining about the industry, their employees, or both, and high turnover. I found that in this industry to be entirely true. If I'm with another owner and they're complaining about their staff or complaining about the industry as a whole, I can almost guarantee that they're leading from the back and they're trying to, to, to they don't want to make the tough choices. They don't want to keep grinding. And uh, as we've heard throughout the course of this conference and as we all know from working in the industry, it's a crazy time right now, you know? Now is not the, you, there's no resting on laurels. There's no set it and forget it. Like, it's still a very, uh, it, it's, it's time to grind, you know? So it's it's a, uh, Man, I talk and talk. Let's keep it moving. Um, The next tenant, I have four. The next tenant, uh, cultivation of staff. This isn't about good hiring or firing practices. I've sat through conferences where we talk about that. We don't talk enough about cultivation of staff. Um, uh, I've, I've found this, you know, as someone who's hired dozens of people at this point. Um, if you're not careful, you get into this mindset where you subliminally expect them to know exactly what you're thinking at all times and to carry that out. And uh, I've, I've dealt with that and been frustrated by it. And much like when we realized that it was entirely our fault when a couple employees weren't really the, the, the right fits, the same realization came true or, or came to be known with, with that. It's like if, if, the, if, if these people aren't doing exactly what you want, then it's, it's on you to, to do that. It takes a lot of time. My brother and I have put a lot of time in the cultivation of our employees. It's not as simple as hire, and, and again, we, we've had incredibly low turnover, so these people have learned with us, you know? If I, you know, when Bissell Brothers was six months old, uh, six months old, and I brought on a close friend to help, I know, like, slightly more than he knows, right? So, so I have to, to, to help him or her um, understand what's really going on in my mind, and it takes time, and it's frustrating for us. In leadership positions, we just want them to know. Look into my brain, you know? Uh, but what we've done is really lean into um, 
training, uh, even from the, the earliest days when it was five, five of us podunks in a room, leaning into uh, sensory training, leaning into, uh, uh, Noah and I would talk openly about like sort of broad theories about how we thought, you know, we really wanted to, to pull these people into our brains. We knew a lot of them to begin with, thankfully, but uh, um, it's, not, it, it's not as simple as a, here's a, you know, couple bulleted job description, hire, or, or, or uh, um, yeah, sorry, I'm incredibly nervous if you can't tell. Um, and uh, what's that? Yeah, all right. Yeah, thanks. Uh, another huge thing to think about with hiring, uh, again, if, if any of our staff right now were to come to me and say, hey, you know, I'm going to take my life in a different direction, or you know what, I'm feeling burnt out, like I, I need to leave Bissell Brothers, I, my first thing would be, how can I help? We're not running a cult, right? Um, but the fact remains that our staff is super strong because so many of them have been with the company for so long. It's an important thing to think about uh, and one, something that's often overlooked. Your staff gets more valuable with every year that goes by because they know more, they're more proficient. So what we have now is a core team. We have about 30 people and we're about to absorb our distributor. So we'll end up with like 35 people on staff, I would say. Um, you... Uh, you, uh, I'm sorry, I keep looking at the time. I just talk and talk. I'm so sorry. Um, we, we, we have this core group of like 10 people that have been with us since within the first year. And it's, they're incredibly valuable. So you want to foster that. You want to you wanna take the time. That's why we, we do so much with staff training. And it can seem monotonous at times. But uh, we, 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 want, we want to hold on to them. Because every year that passes and they're still in our employee, they become that much more valuable. They know more. They're able to train the new people a lot easier. Um, and then the other thing is, this is easy for me to say because our company is able to do it, and it, it might not be the case, but we really want to give them space to be their own people uh, and come to work refreshed. So what that looks like at Bissell Brothers, most salaried employees, well, most employees, at, regardless of whether they work out front or, uh, or they're salaried, Work no more than like 38 hours a week, 35 to 38 hours a week on average. Um, and the reasoning behind that is that we want them to have full, complete personal lives so that when they come to work, they're ready to work. Because, you know, when you, when you have a work week that's uh, European, as we call it, uh, you got to perform. So when, you know, if you're at Bissell Brothers in the office on a Monday afternoon, there's no like casual chit chat. People are working. Uh, and it's efficient, you know, we all, we all uh, and I've, I've, I've done this, you know, we, we talk about employee counts uh, um, as sort of like a, like a humble brag, like, oh, I've got this many employees. Okay, well, like, how efficient are they, you know? Like, as an owner, I want the least number of employees producing the highest amount of uh, work and value for the company. Uh, and we've, we've attained that by treating them as people, um, and, uh, and ag again, making sure that they're personal. This goes without saying that we have great benefits and great PTO and all that. That's, that should be a baseline if you want quality employees in this industry, as I'm sure everyone in this room knows. So I'm not even going to talk about that. I'm talking about what we're doing a step further. Uh, and it's really, there's also a, a huge two, uh, a culture of two-way communication. So what that means is, no and I have worked very hard to be open and accessible in that you can come to me with any idea or question. I don't care if you've been working for me for five months. I want to hear your ideas. Like, the, 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 we're strengthened by having these different inputs, right? It does not mean that anybody can decide to make sweeping changes at Bissell Brothers. I've stopped some of my top employees when they're like, hey, we should do this. I get, they get a sentence in and I'm like, just hold it. I re you, know, you know that I respect that. I can just tell you, you don't waste your time because that's not going to happen this year or next year. It's just not going to happen. So it's not about sort of um, babying anyone or like giving in to like wild demands, but everybody knows that Noah and I are open. We want your, your input. You are a valued human with independent ideas. That, that's, that's why we hired you, you know? So um, uh, cultivation of staff is something that, <clears throat> pardon me, uh, I don't hear enough of, and uh, I hear mainly hiring and firing practices and things like that. Like, we need to work about, or, or talk more about growing the value of the staff that we have. And it, it's, it takes a lot of work. It takes time out of your week, but it's so valuable because uh, our staff at, at Bissell Brothers really is, uh, 
they're, they're an absolute unit at this point, honestly. Um, all right. <clears throat> Um, so moving away from sort of leadership and our practices with our staff, this is a personal one for me as a business owner. Um, one of the best decisions I've ever made was from the earliest days to really own my time and treat it as a currency, <clears throat> excuse me, treat it as a currency equal to or greater than the value of money. We give our time away, something that we all have a finite amount of, we all, we all have uh, the, the exact same amount of every day. It's the one currency that is equal amongst all of us, but we give it away so readily. And in the early days, you know, back, going back to that, that desire to grow and uh, th this, this pain that Noah and I felt from being green and not knowing what we, you know, it was very intimidating. So um, uh, we realized that, okay, we, we've got to focus. We started locking the door. People were coming in. There was distractions. There's so many distractions in this industry because it's all centered around alcohol, right? Uh, so there's uh, always a chance to grab a beer, um, always a chance to, um, to socialize and schmooze, and those things are great. But when you actually have goals, man, that time is worth, to me anyway, is worth more than gold. Um, and what that manifests itself in is that, you know, I, uh, and, and take this for what you will, it's not, I'm not being smug, I'm not being um, um, sort of, I'm not bragging, but like I, I can tell you that as the owner of Bissell Brothers, uh, a brewery that does millions and millions of dollars of annual sales, uh, I have never checked my voicemail in six years. You can email me, you can call, I'll, I'll, but I, I, I had all these inputs, and when you limit your inputs, uh, that's really what I found when you get actual work done. Uh, and it, it leaks into our personal lives too, right? Like I, um, when I go home, I've got a family. Um, I've got another business as well. So it's uh, the, the best choice, I'll leave it at this, the best choice I have ever made was from the earliest days, before we were anybody, before anybody cared or knew that we were making beer, I said, my 24 hours a day are gonna be on my own accord. Um, I, I'm gonna guard that time. I am going to... Um, own it as if it were money, and it's really worked out. So, uh, for what it's worth. Uh, oh, and that, um, uh, that is not a new concept, I will, I will have you all know. Um, Napoleon, the famous French general, uh, was famous for, well, within, within his circles for, he would get war correspondence and all this urgent news and he would refuse to hear any of it. This just happened to me when I was checking my email. Um, he would refuse to hear any of it for three weeks. He would only have his correspondence read by his aides three weeks from when it was received. And he loved to smirk and joke about the fact that so much of what was in the correspondence that was urgent had just sorted itself out. And that just happened. I, I got back to someone that I hadn't gotten back to in a few weeks. Hey, like, I'm ready to hit you with that, that list that you needed. Oh, what? Oh, no, I don't, I don't need that. So it happens with email, too. Um, I'm John, and John, I don't have enough time. So uh, if you have any questions about time management, I would love to talk your ear off about that after. Uh, the last, so uh, again, to, to, since I don't have a slideshow, uh, leadership from the front, cultivation of staff, not just having staff, um, limiting your inputs and time management, uh, owning your time really, because it's not time management, it's valuing your time and understand that to get the work done that you need to get done in a given 24 hour period, you might just need to not get back to some people. Uh, the fourth one is uh, running your own race. This is another one that uh, um, uh, we, we, we tend to homogenize what success means in this industry. We tend to homogenize the paths to get there. I mentioned it earlier. Every one of our 7,000 plus breweries in this country has such a different set of, a set of circumstances, but we tend to, I could spend the next five years with blinders on not paying attention to the industry at large at all, and I would continue, I have a laundry list that I will never finish with improvements that I want to make to Bissell Brothers that have nothing to do with the industry at large. When you, and yes, I'm not saying live in a vacuum or live on an island, that can be dangerous, you know, this industry is changing fast right now, but that can't be all of your time. 
looking at what other people are doing cannot be all of your time. You need to put your blinders on and look at your own company. I guarantee you will find a huge list of improvements that you can make just by what you see right in front of you. That's another huge thing that, you know, we're kind of aloof, you know, like we, um, we, we've, we're traveled, we've been all over the world drinking beer and, and looking at how beer is made, but within our local industry, you know, I, I, uh, I, I would not know about all these mergers and acquisitions and all this stuff if it weren't for Brewbound in my inbox um, because I'm not paying attention. You know, I got, I got work to do. Like, <laughs> there, there's, there, there, there's so much that I want to do with Bissell Brothers that has nothing to do with the market at large. And I don't think that we look internally at our own companies enough. Uh, there's so much that can be done in that, in that regard. Um, I am going to stop talking right now. Justin, I think, has a few questions. And then, honestly, I know that was probably a little bit disjointed compared to some of these polished presentations that we've seen, um, which have been, I told him, this has really been a, a great conference. But I'm Ryan, if you guys have any questions. Um, and yeah. No. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, let's talk for a minute. And if you guys have questions, we've got about five minutes or so, so fire them away. I got all afternoon. And he has all afternoon. Like, I think vulnerability is such a great trait, um, and you clearly have it, and apparently I do too, because I don't know, if you told me you were nervous, I probably about shit myself about 10 times today, so. <laughs> and I don't think anybody here was really expecting a Napoleon quote here to wrap <laughs> it up, so. Um, oh, yeah. So. I, I'm really envious of the way you value your time, and I, I really want to know more about that. How, how are you able to cut out some of that stuff, some of that noise, because... I, it, so, uh, I, uh, a funny thing about that, because this, uh, this has been, like everything else, has been a learning process. I had my, when Bissell Brothers opened, we had painted cans as a really small, you know, we we're one of the first to can in Maine, and it was an arduous process. That's a whole other talk, manual canning with, uh, like, the, these, these manually actuated um, filling heads. <laughs> Holy shit. Um, uh, for, like, for, like, you know, hours and hours at a time, trying to can like that off a 20-barrel tank. That's a story for another day. But um, I had my cell phone printed on the can. <laughs> it seems silly now, uh, but at the time, I was like, I don't, no one's going to, you know, th there needs to be some type of front office, so I put my cell phone printed on the can for the first few years, and that was, that was when I realized, okay, I gotta limit my inputs, because <laughs> I'm getting... That's a lot uh, of input. But uh, it's, uh, it's, it's, when I wake up during the work week, I have like three goals in mind in that day. And anything that isn't related to, to getting those things done, is viewed somewhat as, as a interruption, as a diversion, and I just, the blinders go up. So it means deleting most emails, except for those three that I'm actively working with someone on, clearing them out. You know, uh, w to put it into a word, things that are important will always be important. If you wake up on Monday and, okay, I've got 12 inputs, you know, uh, I'm not going to get to all of them, but anything that's important, I can get to the next day. There's a sense of urgency with our accessibility now, with email and phones and texting, uh, social media. Uh, I, don't, I don't look at social media DMs either. How could you? You know, I've got my email inbox and my phone. Those are the two ways to get a hold of me, and that's just, I made that decision, and really it was just sticking with it, you know? Uh, it seems silly, because I'm not, I'm just a, a guy in Portland, but like, I do get a shit ton of emails and a and endless calls, most of which are garbage. So it's like, all right, I got three things. I'm going to talk with these people about these three things and do my best to get this done, and then I'm done. And anything that I didn't get to that is important will still be important the next day. Can you elaborate a little more on your training program and practices? How often, what's included, et cetera? So one thing I didn't touch on is that, you know, we, we hire people not just for their you know, supposed skills on their resume, but really how they would fit into the whole team. So that's a big part of it. And then, um, you know, uh, it's really like the, the interviews, like we only bring in people to interview when we're hiring. We're actually in, in the middle of a key hire right now, so this is all kind of at the forefront of my mind. Um, we- Do you tell us more. We, um, uh, the, 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 we only bring in people that already have the requisite paper skills. The interviews are really just about getting into their mind and seeing what kind of fit they would be with the rest of the, of the team. Because again, we at Bissell Brothers know, and I really value that, that efficiency. You know, it's publicly, we'll be like, yeah, we've got 35 employees, or, or 
privately were like, yeah, we have like this low number of employees because they're all wicked efficient and uh, it's, it's good for everybody. We pay them more. The company has more financial flexibility to innovate uh, and, and this, that, and the third. So once they're on board, it's like my marketing manager, Lucy, taught her how to take photos uh, and then let her run wild with that because she's already a creative person. That was a requisite. Um, also, taught her about it. You know, like, uh, we really value cross-training. We want, uh, again, it's th this, all, all these things I'm talking about lead to a flexibility that I think is super important as this industry goes forward. It's, a, it's crazy times. And to navigate those, you need to be flexible and nimble. So the cross-training is huge. We don't want everybody to be an I mean, it's impossible for everybody that works at Bissell Brothers to be an expert in all fields, but everybody gets a taste of everything. Any front of the house staff that will have nothing to do day to day with making the beer, they are put on a brew day. They are put on a distribution day. Um, they, every, everyone in the company travels. Uh, we've, we're actually coming into our busy travel season now. Everybody, whether you're, you're working in the tasting room for six months, okay, which of these trips are you gonna get put on? You're gonna go out into the field and talk about our beer with people at this fest somewhere far away. Or you're going to um, do a showcase at a bar in New York. You know, there's no like one person at the brewery that does all the travel. Everybody does it. So cross training and, um, and we, we, we ask a lot. You know, we, we um, force people, not force, that's, that sounds sketchy. Um, um, you, if you work at Bissell Brothers, will be required to take ownership of, of certain things. Like, okay, you're going to New York, like, I expect this event to go well. If you have any questions, let me know, but like, you're gonna be challenged, you're gonna... So we're constantly doing light challenges to make them get better, and we really try to cross-train so that if two people that work in the same department want a vacation in the same time frame, we don't want to necessarily say no. Because yeah. um, we know that there's other factors that have led them to decide that. Uh, I want this week off because it's the week that my wife can take off, or this, that, and the third. So we really try to, um, uh, that flexibility in staff means someone else can jump in and kind of take that, that weight off. It sounds like your leadership and management style comes with a lot of self-reflection on the decision Absolutely. you make and the way you, you make those decisions. People and companies are great throughout history for the same reasons, regardless of industry or, or time that you lived in the world. People are great and people are poor for a lot of the same reasons. And I, I, I do, I try to think about that. Uh, I've got a brother who makes incredible beer and um, my duty is to, is to keep this business being incredible and that, yeah, it, it, it does take you away from the actual industry. I think like many industries, you can, it, it, it can be um, you know, too sort of homogenous and you're making beer and I'm making beer, we're all making beer, we're all awesome, <laughs> you know? Uh, so I do tend to look outside of our industry a lot um, because again, greatness, and inspiration are timeless and they, they transcend any like one industry. Yeah. And I, I do think that this industry in particular can be very homogenous and uh, we tend to, to not look without it and we only look within it and um, you, you can get a lot of inspiration and learn a lot by kind of going beyond our own insular board, uh, borders, so. Well, I know people are gonna have questions for you. Hopefully you'll be able to find him today Thank you for doing this, man. Thank you. I really appreciate it. Yeah, absolutely. It. Thank you. Thank you.